Welcome back to the Barreled Up podcast on the Odyssey Network. Welcome in, everybody. We have a fun one today. Uh, Robbie and I have a special guest, a Yankee fan, which is fantastic because the Yankees are at the center of the baseball universe right now after the Stroman signing and the Snell news and the soda. The Yankees are everywhere. We're going to dive into some Yankees talk and general baseball talk. Those of you that may not want to go too deep into the Yankees, it's okay. We got you covered with everything else. And we're going to talk about MLB The Show 23. Scan is one of the, listen, my opinion, fastest growing MLB The Show YouTubers on the platform right now. So we want to talk about 23 and maybe some 24 wish list items. With that, Scan, welcome in. I'm excited to talk about baseball and, of course, MLB The Show. So uh, I, I'm excited to be on here and uh, nerd out about some baseball today. Robbie, start us off. Let's get into some MLB news. I feel like Yankee land right now is pretty split mm. yeah. on the signing of Marcus Stroman. Uh, people yeah. love it. I'm actually on the side where I I like it. I Based off from a baseball perspective, I do like the move, but then... There's all the off the field stuff. There's, you know, all the interactions that he's had on Twitter with the mm -hmm. Yankee fans out there. And uh, I don't mean that in a positive way, more negative. So yeah. a lot of people getting blocked uh, if he didn't like something you said. Uh, what are your general thoughts just as a Yankee mm -hmm. fan on the signing of Marcus Stroman? Yeah, at first I was very hesitant because you heard all the rumors of them being involved with Snell. Mm -hmm. And you, you probably feel like this would be the the, in the sense, pivot from going from Blake Snell to getting Strowman. And at first, with all the pre knowing all the previous stuff he said, I was like, eh, I don't love this. But sleeping on it and thinking about it, uh, with looking at that rotation as a whole, I am more comfortable with the move because he is a good ground ball pitcher, someone who has succeeded in the AL East before. And even though he recently has had a great ERA at Yankee Stadium. I feel like it could be something that could work out. And especially since it's just a couple of years, I don't feel that worried about the stakes because I know a big thing of Snell is he wanted more years. And obviously there's some potential risk in that. So just a couple of years, see how he does. I'm on board with it at this point, I think. This seemed like a pivot move, though, off of Blake Snell. Yep. And... I'm amazed to think that Blake Snell is turning down five years at $30 million a year. That is the report that is out there. Um, Blake Snell, I can't imagine his market is that much strong, that, that, that he's got enough teams to be turning down five at 30 a year. Um, Scan, the thought of having Snell in that rotation, I sort of was hesitant thinking about it from a Yankee fan perspective because you have Carlos Rodon and Blake Snell kind of mm -hmm. felt eerily similar to Carlos Rodon. Are you at all relieved that Blake Snell turned down that Yankees offer? Or would you like to have seen him put on the pinstripes? Mm -hmm. a, a lot of fans, including me, felt like with personality-wise, he could have been like a good Bit, but yeah. after seeing that he declined the 30 mil a year, I was kind of like, you know what? I'm kind of cool with it just because with how the Yankees have been operating pretty recently, mm -hmm. it felt like they've been more limited than what they used to. Yeah. And with other like big potential contracts looming, like if they want to like lock down a Juan Soto for the long term or anyone like that, then now you have to really start thinking about that money and 30 mil a year for Snell was, mm -hmm. I feel like it wasn't that necessary, especially if Rodon does bounce back and have a healthy year and Clark Schmidt can continue to improve. Mm -hmm. I felt like, you know what? I'm kind of cool with it that they didn't necessarily land him, but uh, I, I do still think about like to myself, it would have been so exciting to see that one-two punch of Cole and Snell. Mm. And especially if Rodon bounced back, that rotation could have been really good. Juan Soto, scan, obviously. Uh, you being the Yankee fan you are. You know, we all know Juan Soto is, you know, obviously going to be getting a good amount of money. But um, yeah. now that he has the record amount for arbitration for one year, um, what, what? how do you feel about Juan Soto 
moving forward? Where, where, where are you thinking in terms of, do you think he's a fit long-term for the franchise? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, do you think this is a good sign that they ended up working something out uh, before the deadline for maybe mm-hmm. uh, the possibility of something long-term down the road? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like just from what I've seen of Soto over the last few years, he seems like someone who loves the the big moment, who I think excels underneath the spotlight. And obviously he's not been someone who's gotten into crazy controversy with the media because we know how the New York media has adds a lot of pressure to people who play here in New York. And just obviously the, the potential of how good Juan Soto could be with his lineup. I don't think I've been more excited for a Yankees move in uh, a long time, but this is just one year. And the fact that they already avoided arbitration, I feel like it's a good start because I feel like this mm-hmm. year could be like a good selling pitch for him. Like, hey, we have you for this year. Let's make sure you enjoy your time. We have a good year to give you a good reason to want to stay in the long term because I'd love to see Yankees be in talks with him once he reaches free agency. Yeah, that could also apply to Pete Alonzo, who got his arbitration deal worked out. And you're trying to create a nice negotiating atmosphere where everybody's in a good place. We just came to agreement on a deal a few months ago. Let's try to work on something long term. Now, the last thing you want to do is go into that arbitration hearing and have to start nitpicking and start yeah. negative talking your superstar player. And there is one team that is now lined up to be in that position. And it is not the Milwaukee Brewers because they got the Corbin Burns deal done. So we don't have to worry about Corbin Burns being pissed off at the Brewers in spring training like we did last year. Vladdy did not come to an agreement with the Toronto Blue Jays. They're about $2 million off, a little underneath. Um, Not as, by the way, Jazz Chisholm, cover of MLB The Show 23, also did not come to an agreement with Miami. And they're only like, $150,000 $150,000 off Miami's being cheap as hell, but the blue Jays and Vladdy seems to be the big one here. Do you feel scanned arbitration hearings? What we've all heard blue Jays. It feels like they're on in a, in a rocky position as it is. Um, are we setting up to a spot? Do you think you get a feel that the blue Jays and Vladimir Guerrero jr. Don't have a long-term future together. Yeah, I think it's tough, especially with how that team has done. Yeah. That I think it's been like they ha- they've had some like shortcomings that yeah. and, like they have like a core of players like him and Bichette and all of them that could have made them a superstar team. And mm-hmm. you know the off season discussion every year, everyone really thinks they're gonna be a top couple team in that AL East, but they don't always live up to that based on that year by year performance. So like I, I feel like for a young player who's come up and seeing all this happen, plus now this arbitration discussion, probably start to get a little bit more frustrated with your team. And, I mean, you start to think, like, okay, what if I was on another team at this point? I feel like it's got to, like, if I were a Jays fan, I would definitely be worried because I remember just the other year with Aaron Judge and the negotiations with his long-term contract, the the panic and all of that because he's the player that you love and you want him forever. Mm-hmm. And when you see these things happen, you're like, okay, it's – setting red flags for the player and just giving them more reasons to want to go, which as a fan, I always don't like. So I feel like it feels like a similar situation, maybe potentially brewing over there. The here's what's interesting. Vladdy has two years left, so this will not be his final year. So there'll be one more year, but that's trouble in itself because they have to go through the process this year and then they don't come to an agreement next year. They have to go through the process all over again. That's mm-hmm. two strikes against you. And I would argue the third strike against the Toronto Blue Jays is that they manipulated his service time a couple of years ago to make him an arbitration four player. So that would be three strikes and you're out if you're the Toronto Blue Jays. If you have to go to these arbitration hearings, talk a bunch of negative talk about him to his face and you manipulated his service time, it's not good. Here we go. Let's fire it up. Talk. Tell us about MLB The Show 23. What's the final verdict? Was it a mm-hmm. win? Was it a loss? Was it mid? What's the general feeling around the community for mm-hmm. MLB The Show 23? It's definitely a really polarizing year. I feel like it's the best yeah. way to describe it. Uh, a lot of people who who are maybe more on the casual side, who like the baseball feel, um, they 
probably really enjoyed it. It had a lot of positive reviews from people who are on that side of things. They added a a new mode in there called Storylines this year, which were like story driven recreations of some of the the greatest Negro League players, like um, Jackie Robinson, Buck O'Neill, and so yeah. many, this whole list of stuff. And that was like so like universally liked by people and uh, people that was like the that game got the game got a lot of praise mainly for stuff like that this year Mm -hmm. um but on the contrary for people who who were maybe more on my side of things who play daily all the time who go into the mode diamond dynasty and keep up with everything there it was very polarizing especially Mm. in that mode because they had some drastic changes called sets where Cards would get added to the yes. game, and then eventually you wouldn't be able to use them in the ranked mode, and then new cards would cycle in. So the goal mm-hmm. was to have them cycle cards in and out. So for a lot of people, some of them really liked it, some of them really hated it. So it's it was very polarizing this year because there were some changes like that that some people really liked, but some people really, really hated too. What was the goal? What was SDS trying to do by doing that? Changing cards in and mm. out. Did they not want you to make these super cards? Did they not want cards to die? Like, mm. what? what's the whole point of taking, removing cards from mm. playability? Yeah, I think the, the, the point, and this is from having discussions with them on stuff, yeah. that they like lineup variety. So mm. they like it when people try different players in different cards and try to get unique with how they build their team like some people want to build a a yankee team or a team of like players from a country or just players that they like in the game and they wanted to create this seemingly to allow people to build the team how they want to and still be able to compete with each other Mm. so since cards rotate in and out it's not the normal cycle where cards gradually get better throughout the year that's how it used to be. You start off right. with cards that aren't as great. You keep playing to keep getting your team better. But with this, the cards are already really good, and you keep playing when the new sets come out to get yep. those new cards so you have more options. And it's not always getting better, but with right. the new season, you have to keep up with it. So I um, think they do it for the variety of things. I think that's the main reason they would do that. I, I'm going to I'm gonna ask a difficult question. Um, mm-hmm. Is it a money grab? Like, 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 seriously, like, it feels like when you, uh, uh, this is, this is just, uh, again, I, mm-hmm. uh, we were talking before we started. I started playing MLB the show when Aaron Judge was the cover and I went all the way yeah. through, uh, the Otani once. So that was five years of playing MLB the show. And when you try to play Diamond Dynasty and your mm-hmm. cards suck, you have a bunch of garbage. Yeah. You kind of feel the need to put some money into the game yes. to be able to go into the marketplace and, and use your stubs and buy good cards. Mm-hmm. And MLB The Show, essentially, what maybe was happening the last few years was that you would get that initial rush. Everyone would buy the game, download the game. They would feel that need to improve their club. So they're opening a ton mm-hmm. of packs, they're ripping, ta- ripping packs, they're running out of stubs. They're adding more money in because they need more stubs. Um, yeah. And then that would stop. Because then you could just earn stuff. Yeah. Is it, is it, is, is, do you think there maybe was a money grab um, it, philosophy? It's interesting because the, the, a lot of the reason the game got hate at the beginning of the year was honestly not because of that sets feature where cards would cycle in and out. Yeah. But at the beginning of the year, there were a lot of the, a lot of the best players were hidden behind packs right. at the beginning of the year. So mm-hmm. if you wanted to get, a 99 overall Mike Trout on the first day of the game, you either had to buy him on the market or you had to get lucky in a pack, which was kind of a shift from the past because, like you said, a lot of the game is you play it, you unlock the cards. So they usually would really reward you for your time. Mm-hmm. But this year there was a shift at the beginning which had a lot, where a lot of these players were in the packs. Like there was a great Mike Trout card. They had some players who were in the World Baseball Classic, not in the MLB, like Roki Sasaki, who was very good, who was in the pack. So people felt like that was like a grab for money because you now put these players in the pack and not in a way I could directly earn it. Yeah. And that was why well, people at the beginning of the year really disliked it because of that. So funny enough, I think that 
aspect there definitely was uh, a, a money grab feel of mm-hmm. trying to get people to spend their subs to buy the packs to get the card at the beginning. But as the year's gone on, almost like you touched on, there was an, a, like a slight adjustment where the drive to spend the money would, would go less and less, and they shifted away from that. Yeah. So I guess we'll have to see if they carry forward with that in 24. Uh, gameplay was good. Was anybody complaining about the hitting mechanics or uh, or, or any of the, the pitching mechanisms? A lot of people who play regularly said it was the best in a long time. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, there were some very, very good players who yeah. play the game very often who were some liked it, some really didn't because they feel felt similar. But most people from what I've seen said it was the best in a long time this year. So they, they made some changes that made the game feel more rewarding when you play it. So yeah. that was a pretty universal thing. A lot of people talk about how the gameplay was its best this year in a long time. Speaking of best in a long time, Robbie, I think you've got something in your back pocket that you want to unleash here. <laughs> oh, I miss MVP baseball. So mm. I think back to the MVP days and I'm like, I can't think of one thing that was wrong with those games. <laughs> what do you think about people today where they say MVP baseball, 2005, the best baseball game ever. Do you think mm-hmm. MLB the show in any way beats MVP baseball 2005? Mm-hmm. It's actually really interesting that you bring this up. Cause I actually recently just got a PS two again, mm. loaded up MVP 05. When I was a kid, I actually didn't play 05. I played a little bit of 04 mm-hmm. and I didn't play that much of it. I played just, I hopped between all the different baseball games and I hopped back on it. I was like, wow. I see why this game gets so much love because the gameplay feels very rewarding and it feels like a, a really authentic baseball experience, especially for a game that's that old. And I didn't play it much, but I know a lot of people praise that game's franchise mode. It had so much more depth to it than even like a game like MLB the show has nowadays. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're someone who's on that side of the game, I've definitely, I understand the sentiment of MVP baseball getting the love that it does. Because on that side of the game with like franchise mode where you're keeping track of the the deals and all of that, uh, it seems like MLB The Show does these things that pull you away. Like you said, the weird trades and the weird signings where it's like, I have no idea how that happened. And it pulls you away from it feeling authentic. And I think, especially for a lot of people, they played MVP baseball a lot and did that back in the day. And they still like, there's so much like there's actually a community of people who still play and mod MVP baseball to mm-hmm. try to keep it updated in it. And uh, it's, I definitely get why people feel that way, especially after playing it recently. I was like, wow, this game is very impressive. Yeah. Even for like a now near 20 year old game. Let's talk about uh, the show 24. Uh, what are some wish list items? Some things you would like to see. I saw on Twitter you had uh, some players you would like to be added. I'm 100% with you on Fernandez, by the way. Yes. Fernandez, I know Daddy Dibu wants um, Julio Franco. I think that would yep. be fantastic to have his batting stance. Um, what are some wish list items for you for mm-hmm. 2024? Yeah, I think my my number one thing is within Diamond Dynasty, I want another mode to play, at least online. Mm-hmm. Because as someone who's been playing diamond dynasty every year since mlb 19 now it the same it's the same cycle every year you play ranked mode you play battle royale or events that's usually it they have the co-op mode this year which is fun but there are some problems with it because it's all connection based so yeah i just want something else that could be a fun thing to to do online in that mode because i find it very repetitive and obviously along with Big improvements to franchise. I'd love for some road to the show, more story within road to the show. And um, I, I mean, those are my heavy hitters. Honestly, yeah. it feels like every year at this point, um, just those three, just road to the show and franchise, especially those two modes are modes I've enjoyed before, but I haven't wanted to play because you, you go back to playing them and they feel like very hollow. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I know a lot of people in other communities and the other games, like a lot of people love 2K and their franchise and they have different modes in there that people really enjoy outside of their my team mode and stuff. And even in Madden, people really enjoy franchise. And 
and that would be the show. I haven't been able to get myself to really sit down and enjoy it like them. So I want to see them add like a lot of improvement to those modes to get me to want to play it more because I have the baseball itch to play the game, but I always have to go back to Diamond Dynasty to fulfill that. Yeah. So hopefully those modes really get their their due justice. Yeah, it feels like the biggest the biggest reveals that we'll get over the next couple of months will be the new legends that are added yes. to the group. And you had a list. Are there you you had a pretty long list? Are there maybe like two or three that you're like I, I mean I am, I'll pay double if this player <laughs> is added. I'll pay double for the game. Um, are there are there a couple of players that are like highest up yeah. on your list? Without a doubt, I think the one that's number one that would excite me the most is Alex Rodriguez. Okay. He, he would be very fun for having mm -hmm. some shortstop cards, being able to play third base. Obviously, his Yankee years, which I have a lot of bias for. Sure. Um, he's someone that would really excite me. And then there's uh, some old school players that haven't been in for a while. Like we don't have Ted Williams. And mm. he's a big name that would be a great one to return. Yep. And um, just a, a very personal one for me is CC Sabathia, mm -hmm. one of my favorite Yankees. And when he existed in the game, because he still played, the he his players in the game weren't always as good as a lot of the big names. So it wasn't as justified to use him. But yeah. nowadays, he could get a very fun card that I would probably really love. So that's yeah. kind of my, my homer pick right there, for sure. Who do you got? For the cover oh, it's a great an question. interesting one because the the answer might not be who you expect but i think it's going to be jose ramirez this year mm -hmm. and the story mm -hmm. comes from how jazz landed on it this year around june july the year before the the marlins were in town and the he jazz stopped by the mlb the show studio and talked to the developers and they publicized it. They put it, made some videos and stuff. Yeah. Saying, hey, we had jazz in the studio. And of course, six months later, they announced that jazz Ooh. is the cover of the game. This year, same thing happened with Jose Ramirez. He went to the mm. studio, visited, signed some baseballs. The studios who made the game actually sent me a Jose Ramirez signed baseball. And wow. all awesome. these things. And I feel like it's a similar pattern where it could, he could end up being the cover just because mm. it was the same thing as last year. So I'm thinking Jose Ramirez, or if they actually go like the normal, let's pick a fun player for the cover. I'm hoping it's Acuna. Yeah, I feel like that's the right choice that's just a, it, because I he did like everything right this pick. year. You know, Jim, who would you have for your cover? It would be, it would be Acuna. Yeah. I mean, he he's the guy. He is the face of baseball right now, coming off of a historic. And, I mean, it makes sense because he put up video game numbers this yeah. past mm -hmm. season something we'd never seen before with the home runs and the stolen bases. I would say I'd go with like a, if they wanted to focus on the future of the game, I mean, Corbin Carroll just had a really good yeah, year. That'd um, be good. Adley Rushman would be a fun one for me. Ooh, yeah, I feel like he's there again, you know, yeah. future face of the game. Like I would love mm. one of those uh, or yes. Bobby Witt. All right, guys, this has been a, a fun conversation. I have really enjoyed it and it's been great having scan into talk. Uh, before we wrap up, before we leave you all, though, Scan, I would love for you to tell everybody where they can find you and what you have cooking up on your side of things. Yeah, you could find me anywhere on social media, either the username Scan with two N's or The Scan, post an MLB The Show stuff all the time. And I'm very excited for this year. I have some fun stuff with the new MLB The Show coming out. And I really want to get into some more real like real life baseball stuff. Probably do some more Blitzball videos this year. I do appreciate everybody coming in, listening, watching.